This class will be concerned with Hertzberg's two-factor theory. It's one in a series of classes on this topic and you should look at the other videos as well. So we're continuing our study here of motivation theory. Now Hertzberg's two-factor theory. Well, first of all, Hertzberg made many contributions towards the study of employee attitudes towards their jobs. So he, he was concerned about the way the employees saw their work and what were their attitudes and what determined their attitudes to their employment, to their particular tasks. The two-factor theory gained acknowledgement in Hertzberg's writings, The Motivation to Work, which was published in 1959. The theory was developed by Frederick Hertzberg in 1958. His research was based on interviews with 200 accountants and engineers from organizations in America. So the two-factor theory emerged from uh, an empirical investigation, a practical investigation. Interviews with accountants and engineers in America about how they saw their work and out of this he induced the two-factor theory. He, he worked out the two-factor theory from the interviews. So the research carried out for his theory involved asking 200 accountants and engineers what has made the individual feel good or bad about their work. So the essential question is what makes you feel good or bad about work? Um, it's a difficult question to answer because it's looking for quite a straightforward response, but what is it? What's, what's the most important factor that determines your attitude towards work? The findings suggested that the factors which led to satisfaction were different to those factors that contributes to dissatisfaction. So, the factors that led to satisfaction are different from those that led to dissatisfaction. Uh, they're simply not negatives. Uh, a positive attitude towards something that leads to satisfaction, the negative of that doesn't lead to dissatisfaction. So, it's more complex than saying uh, the negative of something will be dissatisfaction. It's not necessarily the case. From his findings he developed the two-factor theory of motivation. The two factors were labelled as hygiene factors, dissatisfaction, and motivator factors, the job satisfaction. So we have two factors, factors which lead to dissatisfaction and factors that lead to job satisfaction. And it's a question of determining which one is dominant and which one prevails within an organization as to, to gauge how motivated the staff are. The two factors were distinct and separate from each other. The findings suggested that where employees are not motivated does not necessarily imply that they are demotivated, merely just not motivated. So not motivated and demotivated are different. Not motivated means they are not applying themselves effectively. They are not that interested in their work. They're doing it, but they're not motivated. They don't have a positive attitude towards the job. They have uh, a get-by attitude. They will do it because it is their work. If they were demotivated, they would be uh, more adamant about their opposition to the work. They would be actively seeking other types of work, um, other avenues uh, to, to earn an income. So demotivated is, is stronger 
than simply not motivated. Uh, where hygiene factors were improved does not lead to satisfaction but to a, a non-dissatisfied state. So if the conditions of employment, if the physical environment in which the job takes place, if that was improved, it doesn't mean that the, the workers will be satisfied. It means they are less dissatisfied. So this may sound very negative, but we have two components here. One which is the the factors that lead to dissatisfaction and the factors that lead to positive satisfaction. So an improvement in the hygiene factors, an improvement in the conditions of work, doesn't necessarily mean that the workers are satisfied. It means that they are perhaps less dissatisfied. So let's look at two-factor theory. Well, we have employees. Employees are dissatisfied and unmotivated at work. Let's start from this position, a pretty bad position to start from. Now from there we can say employees are neither satisfied nor unmotivated. So if you like the next one along. Uh, it's it's better than the previous one but it's it's not still not very not very good. And we get from this very bad state where the employees are dissatisfied and unmotivated to the one where they're neither dissatisfied uh, but they're unmotivated. Uh, we get there because the hygiene factors have been improved. The hygiene factors, the conditions of the work has been improved and there's less negativity about going to work. And the next one up is is the good one. It's um, the employees are satisfied and motivated at work. And these are the motivation factors. This is when people are positively motivated. So we move on this scale from workers not engaging with their work, not interested, not they're dissatisfied to one where it's okay the job is okay we're we're not dissatisfied and we're not we're not engaged either but it's it's passable it can be done to the one where the employees are satisfied and are actually motivated at work so we we use the hygiene factors to get rid of the the negativity parts we improve the the conditions of employment we try to deal with the issues that's causing the extreme dissatisfaction. These are the hygiene factors. And later on, when the workers are in a state of the job's okay, they can do it, they're, they're not motivated, but they're not dis unmotivated either. They're not, they're not uh, dissatisfied, no, or not too dissatisfied. When you get to that stage, motivation factors may be applied to turn them into very active and interested employees. Let's have a look at the hygiene factors. Uh, for a start, one hygiene factor is the company policy and the administration. The company policy, what is the company policy about uh, the conditions of work? Uh, what's the company policy about uh, hours of work and times of work and the conditions of work itself. What's the physical environment and what's the administration like? Is it friendly and competent or is it uh, quite standoff and not not associated with let's say the, the shop floor? What's the what is the amount of wages and salaries and other financial re rewards? Uh, do people feel that their their contribution is being adequately rewarded? If they don't, they're not going to engage. And what's the level and quality uh, of supervision? Uh, are the supervisors constantly intervening and 
constantly hassling the workforce? Or are they, the supervisors supportive and giving the workers the feeling that they're working in a team and all in it together? And Or do they make them feel that they're doing a bad job and that they're uh, they're not very intelligent or they're not very they're not contributing a lot and what exactly is the quality of the supervision how much supervision is there and, and what sort of supervision is it is it supportive or is it quite aggressive towards the workers what are the interpersonal relationships at work how do people relate to each other um, are there facilities at work to enable them to to mix and get to know each other? Is there a canteen where they can go and have lunch or or have a break, go and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee uh, sometime and talk to their friends, get to know their friends, feel that they're working together and they're it, it's it needs to have some sort of family feel about it that they're they're working in a team and their colleagues are supporting them and egging them on to do a good job or is it the case that there's no interpersonal linkages whatever the company doesn't condone it doesn't do anything to help it along the the company just stands back and <clears throat> the people don't they don't mix there's no interpersonal relationships at work there's no feeling of uh, comradeship and working together in a team. What are the working conditions? Is it a nice working environment or is it polluted and noisy and um, dark and dingy and do people get enough daylight? Are there windows? It could be as basic as that. So what are the working conditions? If the working conditions are poor the workers will be dissatisfied. Um, job security. Do they feel that they, they've got job security? If they don't, they don't feel uh, re connected or related to the business. They feel they could be made redundant at any moment, so they're not going to try that hard. They're not that interested. So job security affects the hygiene factors. Now you remember that's our diagram we had earlier so we've we've talked about the hygiene factors which uh, these factors are the ones that move us from a dissatisfied and unmotivated workforce to one which is not dissatisfied. Uh, I know it's a double negative but they're not dissatisfied. They're not satisfied either. They're just not dissatisfied. Uh, but they're unmotivated. They're they're not they're not motivated. They need to be motivated next. So the hygiene factors converts them into a state where they're uh, not dissatisfied. But now they need to be motivated to turn them into employees that are satisfied and motivated, which is the ideal situation. So let's move over and talk about um, the motivation factors. Well, motivation factors could be linked to status and opportunity of career progression. Um, opportunities to promote themselves and uh, get a better salary and be in a better position to have a, a good life by working hard by applying themselves and by being motivated within the job but but the work must enable this to happen the company must enable it to happen the company must respect the workers and praise them and give them the opportunity to move on to to get advancement to get promotion so they must be recognized their contribution should be recognized the proverbial clap on the back they, they should feel uh, a job well done and uh, someone should say it to them when the job is well done and they've put in a lot of effort they should receive some praise for that and be recognized for it 
And they need to have a sense of achievement that what they've done has been recognized and they, they've done it. They, they feel proud of themselves. They feel proud that they've managed to do something which was difficult and the company recognized it and they've got respect for it. And there's a feeling that they know what's reasonable. The company doesn't expect too much from the workers. It expects a fair day's work. But it doesn't expect the earth. It doesn't expect the, com the, the workers to do the impossible. There must be a reasonable expectation. And the workers should be able to achieve what is expected. So it has to be realistic. The company should have good growth prospects, but so also should have the individuals within the company. The individuals should see the business prosper and they should be able to share in that prosperity. They should be able to think about promotion and think about um, being more involved in the business. A challenging working environment can be a good thing. Challenging in the sense that the workers can think about the job, think about the way it's done, make recommendations for improvements, recommend innovations in the workplace, and the company will take the recommendations seriously. They may not adopt them, but they will seriously consider them, and if there's merit in what is said, the, work pra the working practices may be changed. So the workers feel involved. The nature of the work. Uh, if the work is hard manual work, there may not be an opportunity for the workers to reflect on the job and make innovative proposals. The job requires a routine and the routine has to be followed. So it's the simple nature of the work. And some work can be very dehumanizing. When the work is broken down into very small tasks and the individuals doing a very small tasks a task repetitively that can be soul destroying the worker is not valued he, he or she doesn't feel valued they feel that they are part of a big machine and their contribution is to do a very small task and pass on the job they don't see the finished item even they're they're like cogs in a big wheel. So the nature of the work should be looked at. Can the work be enriched? Can extra functions be added to the work which will give some variety to the worker and thereby be more engaging? Now the possible outcomes of the model. Well high hygiene and high motivation. Acknowledging both factors is known as the best case scenario for any employee. Employees are highly motivated in their job and have fewer complaints. Overall has job satisfaction. So if there's high degree of motivation, a high degree, um, a high level of hygiene, in other words good working conditions, then the workers will be motivated, the chances are. They will engage with the tasks, they will be more productive, there will be less absenteeism, um, they will make every effort to be efficient within the workplace and the company will benefit from that. If there's high hygiene and low motivation, the jobs will be carried out only for the sake of pay. Um, in this case employees have a few complaints but are not motivated enough. They're, they're, they have few complaints. Um, in other words they, they, they have very little to complain about. The, the hygiene has been fixed. The working conditions are fixed. It's, it's not a bad place to work. It's just that they're not being paid enough so they're not motivated. They're working for money 
they are not being respected as individuals, their their opinions are not being sought, they don't feel like they're working in a team. There's low motivation. So they feel that the place is okay to work, but they're not really that motivated. When does low hygiene and high motivation? Uh, in this scenario, employees view the job as interesting and sufficiently challenging. However, the working conditions are poor. So, in this case, the workers like uh, the job, but it's just the working conditions, perhaps the physical environment in which they're working is poor. It's dirty, contaminated, it's um, noisy, um, there are poor facilities for the workers, um, and it can be anything. Um, the, the toilets or restrooms may not be nice or kept properly or the there may be no canteen where they can sit down and have a break um, the quality of the supervision may be all wrong but the workers see that their the job could be interesting it could be a nice place to work and it could have a good salary and they could make a career out of it they could make a life out of it it's just that the the environment is not right. The hygiene factors are not right. When there's low hygiene and low motivation, this is the worst case scenario for a business. The employees are not satisfied in their job roles and neither uh, are they too happy about uh, their working conditions. This is the lowest level of job satisfaction for the employee. Um, low hygiene, low motivation, means high labour turnover, dissatisfaction, high absenteeism, uh, not a good situation. Now the apl application of the model, well, demotivated staff cause the following problems. Low or poor productivity, um, so there's very poor productivity if the, the staff are not motivated. There could be constant strikes or industrial disputes or poor employee relations. The workers are unhappy. They don't want to be there really. They're frustrated. They're annoyed. They want the, the business to change and become a better place to work but they can't see any way of doing it so there's industrial issues. They're not happy about the amount of salary and the working conditions. So it's it's not a good situation. Now, how to motivate staff? Well, Hertzberg suggested three possibilities. First of all, job enlargement, or job enrichment, it's also called provide sufficient challenging tasks to encourage employee motivation. Just involve the workers. Get their opinion. Ask for recommendations. Talk to them. Make them feel that they're a part of a team, which they are. Rotate the jobs. Um, try to give the workers different experiences. If the work is, is boring, move the workers on a regular basis so they're doing a different task. That will create more interest. And job enrichment. Requiring, uh, this is job enrichment itself. Uh, job enlargement was uh, so, uh, making the tasks uh, challenging. But job enrichment uh, requires intrinsic motivation, motivation from inside. The job should have sufficient challenge to make full use of the employee's capabilities. So make the job sufficiently challenging, make it sufficiently interesting so that the, the workers can think about the job and think about how it could be better done and get more involved with what they're doing. So it's job enrichment. It's still the job but they can think about the job in innovative ways. So job enlargement, 
um, making the, the challenge uh, sufficiently interesting. Job rotation, moving the workers around so that they, they get different experiences and they don't get bored on any one particular job. And job enrichment uh, where they are capable of looking at a particular job and seeing what can be done to improve the task. Now the criticisms of the model well the findings for developing this model um, are research method dependent so the only way the model can be looked at is by looking at research and using different research methodologies are less supportive of the model so the, there's a problem about testing it um, the evidence th there's no consistency I should say probably in, in the approaches for testing it so the evidence is not clear cut the theory is not clearly explained and set out therefore it causes different interpretations when replicating this work um, as we've seen by the models we have a lot of ideas here, we have a lot of ideas about uh, what are the hygiene factors, what are the motivating factors, um, how to engage people at work and get them more interested. Uh, we have lots of what seem to be very reasonable points, um, but they, they are open to interpretation. Different people may interpret them differently and that may lead to confusion. So, as to what's a hygiene factor, some people say it's this and some people say no it's not, it's something else. There may be an issue uh, about listing the, the various hygiene factors in specific companies. Some people maybe uh, may think about, well, the job is whatever it is and there's no chance to enlarge the job or to make it more interesting or to have job enrichment and it may also be too few tasks to have job rotation and so there may be criticisms of the model because it's it can't be applied or it can't be interpreted clear-cut in all organizations there are individual differences and preferences and the model can't take that into account um, what is demotivating for somebody may not be demotivating for somebody else. Uh, what motivates one person may not motivate the other person. So people are different. So we can't say one size fits all. There are issues of just looking at different people and uh, recognizing that they are motivated differently and demotivated differently. Um, it's widely used to explain the attitudes of unskilled workers. However, as I said right at the very start, the model was originally for accountants and engineers. It's just that we can see it more clearly in the context of unskilled workers, perhaps even in an engineering environment where they're on the shop floor, they're they're doing a repetitive task. Uh, the environment may not be very nice. It might be noisy. It might be um, not lit properly. Uh, there may be the smell of oil and and machinery and so uh, that's the image we we take away from studying the mo uh, the the model. But remember, it was originally started with accountants and engineers. So, a different, started life differently. So, the criticisms of the model, well, uh, it's difficult to test it because different research methods, number one, the first point, different research methods lead to different conclusions. 
uh, it's difficult to interpret what's meant in the case of all jobs. Uh, quite simply, companies have different uh, conditions of employment and what's a motivating factor or a hygiene factor in one may not be in another. Um, individuals have different preferences as well, so individuals uh, will interpret situations differently and what motivates one person, as I said, may not motivate another person. And it has moved finally from unskilled, sorry, from, from skilled workers, I should say, from accountants and engineers to the unskilled. That's really where we, we think of it residing mostly nowadays. Whether that's right or wrong is also debatable. But in a very interesting model, very famous in the study of business and management, and a model that you must be familiar with. But that's all I'm going to do on this topic for the moment, so I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you for watching.